love coming to work. Our guest today, why? Because of our guest today. This one's for me. This is a very special lady. She has been entertaining us for many years. This is Batman, Catwoman. Speak of the angel. Eartha Kitt purred her way to success as the Catwoman on the TV series Batman, and that sexy feline image has helped Eartha maintain a career that has spanned over five decades. She was a hit on the stage and screen and one of the highest paid cabaret singers in the world. But behind that sultry, sexy image, there's a woman sometimes filled with pain and anger. Eartha said her mother was only 14 years old when she was raped by a plantation owner's son. Eartha was the illegitimate child, raised as an outcast and called an ugly duckling. The ultimate rejection came when her own mother gave her away. She went to live with neighbors who then beat her and abused her sexually. Eartha said the only escape she had was performing. She believed the audience was her family and the applause was the sound of approval. Today, at age 60-something, Eartha Kitt says she's paid her dues. She says as long as there's an audience, she'll keep on entertaining. A star, and I don't use that word lightly, a real legend, Eartha Kitt. say that's my family they love you that's wow. your family oh. <laughs> how do you get these modern gadgets on here is that all right i think it's going to be as good as it's going to be <laughs> we're so it took so long to get you to come and spend some time with us i am so happy you know eartha said she could describe her life in six words want to do that for us six words oppressed oh, Depressed, oppressed, dejected, rejected, rejected. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That really is. All right. Let's start at the beginning because we have a luxury here that uh, not a lot of shows have. And when you see a performer, you can't really get the background. And um, I just, I think it's such a wonderful story. I think you're such a wonderful story. Because, baby, if you can make it happen, anybody can make it happen. <laughs> what a beginning. We said that um, you grew up in the South. You were born in the South. Where in the South? As far as we know, uh, near Columbia. It's a little area called North. But we're not quite sure because we went back there to do the Eartha Kitt documentary. A man came into the churchyard and we asked him if he knew me. He said, yes, I know that face. He said, I know that face before that face knew its face. And, <laughs> and as a result, he said that we came in from another area, but where from, I, I have no idea. You think that uh, there was a plantation owner's son who was white yes. and that he raped your mother and she yes. was about 14 years of age. Yes. We don't hear the phrase yella, mm -hmm. yella with a southern accent, yeller. Mm -hmm. High yellow anymore mm -hmm. to people even people who are black who've never heard it what does that mean you're not accepted when they call you a yellow gal it's like calling you a nigger even maybe even worse than that because a yellow gal means that you are not here and you're not there you don't belong to either side you are rejected you're in between the cracks so instead of thinking that being mulatto mm -hmm. or in Spanish Tregeno is beautiful instead oh, of yes, saying Oh, yes, compared that. to being called Yella. 
That's because that means you're an ugly duckling and no one wants you. And you're generally, if you're, in my case, given away, then you're used as a work mule. You're doing all the chores. You're the first one to wake up in the morning with this family that my mother gave me to. I was the first one to wake up in the morning, which is at the crack of dawn, which I still do until this day. I never got out of the habit. <laughs> and you do all the chores that you're capable of doing at that age. And that's when you are able to walk, you start working because you've got to earn your way. Nobody pats you on the head and says thank you for anything. You know, Bertha, when you hear people poor, you think of a, a shack in the South. You didn't have a house. No. <laughs> you are walking in the woods and sleeping in a pile of leaves at night. Yes. I mean, forget. And, and you said your mother wasn't carrying anything but you and your little sister, Pearl. That's right. That's so there, the was first no, thing. there were no clothes or luggage or belongings or backpack or anything? No, we had absolutely nothing. That's the first scene in my life that I remembered. And that was the beginning of the book, the first book that I wrote, A Thursday's Child. All I saw were cotton fields and the longest road that you ever want to picture in your whole life. And I'm probably just able to walk. And I just remember my mother and carrying my, my sister, my sister, half-sister actually, my, my half-sister is much, much darker than I am, and being rejected at every house that my mother knocked on, asking for shelter for the night at least. And it seemed to me as though she, when she was about to be received in the door, they saw me and they saw what color I was. And it was suddenly, no, I don't want that yellow gal in my house. So my mother was constantly on the move. Even when she went to her own relatives, her uncles, whom I think were her uncles, I'm not quite sure what the relationship was, but I heard that they were her uncles. Even they said, no, I don't want that yellow gal in my house. So even in their place, my mother put us in the barn and we slept with the, with the animals, which was okay. <laughs> I, at, least I didn't, was I didn't, <laughs> as in, at least there was some kind of shelter. And when we were pushed out of there, so the following day, she went on and on and on, knocking on doors. And there were times we slept in the forest. She would make a, a bed of straw, and she would put us in there. And one morning I woke up, and I thought, sure, my mother had gone away, and she had uh, left us in the forest. And I, it was such a marvelous picture, a lonely picture, and it's a picture that I will never forget. When I was thinking that my mother was gone, and now what, if, what was my sister and I going to do? Through the trees, in the morning light, and the dew, I could see my mother's figure coming through the shadow, through the dew and the sunlight. And her skirt was lifted with whatever she had stolen from whatever farm she could get food. And I think it was a happy, <laughs> the beginning of realizing what a happy moment is really like. When you eat. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw my mother coming back with food instead of um, deserting us. But it the, wasn't long after that that she did uh, give she us left away. Mm -hmm. And there's an image there. Uh, mother, was it that she found a man? Why did she, why did she leave you? Well, she I was, must have been a child herself. She was. And as I went through the years uh, trying to understand, although you could never, I think, alleviate the feeling of your mother giving you away, you tried to understand to the best of your ability. And I understand that my mother was terribly young and she could not uh, take care of two babies. She was almost a baby herself. and. When we were received in this cabin in the middle of the cotton fields, finally accepted in this cabin, I was still hiding from the lady who opened the door. But we were received because the lady was blind and she couldn't tell what color I was. So I could stop hiding. I could at least come out and, and show that <laughs> so that I could at least be free for a moment or two, you know. But it was in that house that in the night I woke up. I don't know where this man came from. But I heard my mother sobbing because you're as a cabin and you have holes in the walls and all that. And I heard my mother sobbing and I woke up and I looked through the cracks of the wall. And my mother was on her knees in front of a fireplace, begging and pleading to this man to please accept Eartha May. And he said, no, I will not accept that yellow gal in my house. He said, but I, I will accept Pearl, who is my half-sister. 
but I will not take her with me. And with the crying and the sobbing, I didn't want my mother to know that I was hearing what was going on. Because I didn't really talk in those days anyway. I never wanted to bring attention to myself. As a matter of fact, Sally, I've never changed until this day. I don't want to bring attention to myself. I, Earth May, she's always hiding, except when she's on stage and all dressed up in a leather. And then she can do, you know, character. But I was silent. And it was either the next day or maybe a day or so after, I don't know, sense of timing, my mother took my sister and myself because I heard my mother say to him if I have to give Eartha May away then I will give them both away because they will at least be company for one another but my sister was still a baby in arms and she took us to this family who had two teenage children and I saw my mother leaving on the arms of this man and the last figure I saw of her until she died was the back of oh, my mother walking away with this man. And sometime after that, my mother had a baby by him. And the feeling that I had that my mother had a baby by this man was something that I don't think I have ever been really able to accept. That's Almeida, she lives in Philadelphia too. We all found, I found my sisters when I became famous in New Faces of 52. But this family that she gave me to, these two children, not being the right color was all they had against me. That's all they needed. And they tied me in a croaker sack whenever they had the opportunity and tied me to a tree. And after sending, this was after they had sent me to a tree with a peach tree switch for them to whip my derriere until I could not sit down, until the blood was streaking down my legs and the whelps were so huge that you can't sit, you can't stand, <laughs> and you cannot show anybody. And the boy was also sexually abusing me. So now how do you say this to these people? I was too shy anyway to begin with, never to bring attention to myself and to explain what was going on, which you really do not understand what is going on anyway, because if you are a rejected child and you're not wanted by this group or that group, and you are considered a nothing and nobody thinks of you as being a human being, you just want to disappear. So who would have understood and whom, how would I say what was going on with me? So I went through that, and also being the work mule in that family, until my aunt, my mother's sister, who lived in, New lived in New York, unfortunately she's gone now too, received letters from South Carolina that told her if I was not sent for, that they would either beat me to death, or starve me to death, or work me to death. But what that does is develop something in some people, a hunger that is so enormous that in its rather perverse way it benefits the world. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Our guest, Eartha Kitt. <laughs> Just about every really great person in show business that has nothing to do, by the way, with famous person. Just about every great person has an emptiness inside that is uh, trying to be filled up, a desertion, so that the acceptance of the audience does what uh, other forms of love did not do. We kind of skipped over um, what eventually happened to your mother. My mother was murdered by the stepchildren of this family. And uh, the way it happened, of course, being a non-speaking child, I would listen to every conversation of the grown-ups under the house or around the house, <laughs> behind <laughs> whatever, behind a tree. And I heard that when my mother took ill, that two sisters had corresponded with one another, the one that was still in, there in the family, and one that had gone up north, maybe Chicago, New York, somewhere, 
and there was a correspondence between the two of them. The letter that went down, went to, to Chicago or here up north, said that my mother was unfaithful and they wanted to get rid of her and how can we do it? A letter came back to the South that said, don't worry, when I come home, I will get rid of her in a way that she will never be able to come back. Shortly thereafter, after this one came home, the uh, dinner was being put on the table with my mother and that stepsister, stepdaughter. And the others were out in the fields. My mother was sent to the well by the stepdaughter to get water and she came back with the water and there was these two dinners on the table. And my mother thought, why is it that you are feeding, why are we eating now before the family comes in? And she said, oh, I wanted you to try something. And as a result, she had put this poison in my mother's food. And my mother, when my mother took ill, uh, she said when she became conscious at times, she would start talking. And this is how the story went from one person to the other. That uh, she got ill to her stomach and she was going to go to the door to regurgitate. But her husband came in at the same time and she didn't get sick and she held it. And that's what made her more ill than she would have been if she had regurgitated it. Now, her husband was supposed to go get the doctor immediately. But it has been confirmed with my sister, who's now living in New Jersey, that he was told by his daughters that they had done this. Now, if he had gone to get the doctor, it would have been either him giving up his two children to the law, or he had a choice of letting my mother go. Let her go. So he let my mother go. So my mother laid there for some months. Sometimes she would get so pain and she would start to tell what was going on, what had gone on. Now, when she died, the neighbors saw a burning in the, in the yard. They had taken the mattress, the children had taken the mattress, put it in the yard and started to burn it. The neighbors saw the fire, they came and started to put it out and they saw these voodoo things in the mattress, in the center of the mattress, with letters that had come from the sisters, and that's how they found out that it was the truth of what it had, uh, my mother was saying. Now, if this was not so, the superstition is that if a mother with a young baby is taken away against the will of God, that the mother will come back and take the baby. Her spirit will come and take the baby. So when they buried my mother and I was standing there watching this whole ceremony, they had to pass my young sister across the grave several times to break the line between heaven and earth and the body in the grave so that my mother's spirit would not be able to grab the child. If my mother had died by natural causes or by the hand of God, that ritual would have never happened. A fascinating insight to a time and a place. Let's take <clears throat> little Eartha Kitt and bring her up north and show her a big city for the first time. <laughs> Had you ever seen a flush toilet? <laughs> I'd never even seen Santa. I'd never even seen civilization, let alone a flush toilet. It, it was a culture shock, and I still, I'm still in shock, as a matter of fact. Lights that go on and off with a switch, right? Yes, it's magic. But first of all, when my aunt sent for me, she sent two sets of everything. Two underwear, two next to that, and two shirts, and two dresses, and two everything. So they put me in everything. <laughs> And my hair was very long so and very thick, so I had three braids going here and one going over my head with a French beret on and, <laughs> and boots up to God knows where. <laughs> and I had only seen a little flake of snow, you know, at some time or the other, and so I didn't know what snow was all about. But this is how they wanted to frighten me, to make me stay down south, because once I was gone, they didn't have this little work mule anymore. So, the first time I had a bath, <laughs> I think, and it was one of those rare times they combed my hair. Oh, they made such a fuss over me, I felt like a queen <laughs> in the tub that they were bathing me in. And now they were saying as they're bathing me, now, now you know 
the trains fly in the air, and sometimes they fall down on people. And you know, these houses, <laughs> these houses are gigantic, and people live on top of one of each other, like little ants in a cubby hole, and sometimes they fall down. So you're always frightened to be living in this. You don't want to go up north, do you, Eartha? Well, I didn't say one word. I just kept my mouth shut. So they made uh, my, my catfish sandwich. The first time in my life I had a piece of white bread. And I remember it was silver cup bread. I'll never forget it. Here goes the Long Ranger. Every time I hear the Long Ranger, I remember silver cup bread. I owe silver. So I, <laughs> I had a sandwich, a catfish sandwich, an apple, and I think a peach, and a piece of sweet potato pie. And I sat on the train with my little tag that said, I w my name is Eartha May Kitt, and I am to be met by Mamie Kitt. And I think Pennsylvania Railroad Station. Well, I sat with my head at the, my face at the window all night long. I didn't sleep, holding my little shoebox of sandwiches. We get to New York. So the porter comes and gets me, and he takes me outside. I never saw so many people before in my whole life. <laughs> And I felt as though everybody was, I felt like a little ant. Everybody was going to walk on top of me. And I was going like this, you know, <laughs> running away from people. I think I'm still running away from this crowd of people. And then they told me that the trains were going to fly in the air and they're going to fall down. Well, what do we do? We get on a bus. And the bus is under the train track. <laughs> So you hear the chugga 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 and I'm looking out the window waiting for the train to fall on top of us. Now we get to 143rd Street, 126 West 143rd Street. And now we go on the second floor. Well, I'd never been up a pair of stairs before in my life. That was also a shock. Then we opened the door and the, rang the bell, opens the door, and somebody pushes a button or something and a light goes on. It's... Alice in Wonderland, I thought. <coughs> Not that I knew anything about Alice in Wonderland, but to me it was magic. So I looked at the button for a moment and then I went on because as a, a girl who was brought up in the South, you know, very polite and all that sort of thing, I paid attention to what was going on and they led me in the, to the sitting room. Now my aunt was thinking that I was healthy and so on and so on. You looked so, good. You had yeah, a big... Yeah. <laughs> You had a lot of clothes yes. on. You <laughs> yes, until they took the clothes off. And, you know, a little stick. <laughs> that's right. Although you do have a little pot belly because it's like almost pellegre, you know, yeah. uh, undernourished and so forth and so on. So anyway, they discovered that. So anyway, I had to go to the bathroom. So I looked out the window. <laughs> I looked out one window and I looked out another window. I'm looking for the outhouse. So finally, I didn't see anything that looked like an outhouse. Besides, it's up on the second floor. I didn't know where the devil would, what did you do? <laughs> so, so finally, I was sitting there, you know, and going all sorts of um, physical things with myself. <laughs> and finally, I think my aunt finally realized that maybe she's in trouble. <laughs> so she takes me to this little room. <laughs> and she leaves me there. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw the bathtub, and I saw the sink, and I saw this other thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do, so I sat on the side of the bathtub going like this for I don't know how long, until finally I think my aunt realized that I was missing. <laughs> so finally she came into the bathroom, and she was hysterical, because now I couldn't hold myself any longer. I was getting into real trouble. So finally she went there. So you, yeah. Bertha May meets the toilet. Right. <laughs> she meets the boy. Antival, au milieu de la ville. Et naturellement, they fall in love. Petit Val, où j'étais connu, souviens-toi, tu n'étais pour moi ce soir-là, rien qu'un inconnu. I think the part of Eartha's life that I like best, she's uh, written a book that was published in England. I tell you that in case you're traveling. Um, but 
there were other stories like when she heard the radio we're going to move uh, get Eartha to move along by accident she went to an audition it really was an accident and it was for Catherine Dunham and they were very famous the Catherine Dunham dancers and before she knew it the little girl had a scholarship and ten dollars a week which by the way was my first salary I got two dollars <laughs> a day when I first started work and I related to that like mm -hmm. crazy but it took you around the world to see a lot of other toilets and radios <laughs> and sinks and things like that. And uh, even Orson Welles saw you up on a stage one day mm -hmm. and said, wow, huh? The most exciting woman in the world. She won't say this because she's, you know, it's not exactly mm -hmm. the kind of thing. But you worked with Sammy. Yeah. And since Sammy has just recently passed on and, and he's a friend that we share, Tell me about that. Was that romantic? Was there, was there a romance going, I guess? Well, I was engaged to Sammy for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I had known Sammy for a while because we went to San Francisco with New Faces of 52. That's where I met Sammy. And he happened to have been standing in the stage door, and I sent him out for coffee because I thought he was, you know, the somebody coffee Somebody you sent for Yeah, somebody you sent for coffee. <laughs> And he went along with the joke because when he came back, he handed me the coffee. And then by that time, the girl who introduced me to Sammy told me who he was. I still didn't know who he was. But Sammy got fascinated, I guess, as he told me later by me. He started to take me out. And we would walk into a restaurant and they would say, oh, this way, Miss Kit, please. And Sammy Davis would say, how come they introduce you to a table? I've been in this business since I was four years old and they still don't know who I am. And you've only been here for a year and everybody in the world knows who you are. I said, that's the way it is, Sammy. <laughs> 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 so we were always teasing each other about this. So one day, well, after I was teaching Sammy not to read just comic books, you must know uh, artwork and so, you know, verify your, your intellect. And he was fascinated by that and I taught him how to drive a car and so forth and so on and so on. So we were getting very, very close. So he would take me to the theater, and one day, in the middle of San Francisco Avenue, the biggest avenue in San Francisco at the time, I was on my way to the theater, and he was going in one direction. And as I got in the middle of the street, Sammy yelled out, I'm going to be bigger than you are one of these days if it kills me! <laughs> so, stopping traffic and so forth and so on. I was hysterical with Sammy. He was a lot of fun to be with. But when he wanted to get engaged to me, it was after he had lost his eye. And I was communicating with him in the hospital all the time and also through friends to see how he was. So I had reopened at La Vie and Rose because, you know, as when I first came back to America, I was guessed I was seen in too many languages and people thought, what is that, you know? So I wasn't, a, I wasn't a success in the beginning. So I started all over again after becoming famous in New Faces and doing exactly the same act at La Vie and Rose. And there I was, the hottest thing in America. So my dressing room opening night had Doris Duke and all these people at the Blah, 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 blah. And in walks Sammy Davis with this teensy wincy little box in his hands, all wrapped in blue with a little bow. And he walks in and he says, Kit, will you come and meet me in the bathroom? I want to show you something. It's a secret. I said, Well, how much of a secret can it be? Everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Sammy, man, no, no, no. He said, No, 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 no. You would come into the bathroom with me and I'll give you, I want to give you something. So he takes me into the bathroom. I said, Sammy, I cannot take this ring. Well, just put it on for tonight, he said. Nobody will know. How can anybody know? He wants me to put it on. I walk back into the room and the whole world knows already. Sure. The thing that squelched, really, not that I was in love with Sammy, although he was a, a great guy, and I, for me, he was a wonderful person. A lot of fun. But when he left my dressing room, he went straight to the telephone and called the newspapers that he had given Eartha Kitt the ring, and I did not appreciate that at all. Other men in your life. Let's talk about a president in your life. Eartha was against the Vietnam War, went to the White House, and opened your big mouth at the wrong time. For a lot of us, it was the right time to have opened your mouth. But was there a form of blacklisting that went on? No, it wasn't blacklisting, it was whitelisting. Right. <laughs> Come to think of it, that's <laughs> brilliant. It was the White House, not the American people. Uh, within two hours, I was out of work. That's what it said on my dossier that was given to me or introduced to me by Seymour Hirsch and the New York Times, um, Jack Anderson. It seemed that I was, well, I was invited to the White House and an invitation that said, why is there so much juvenile delinquency in the streets of America? Now, I work with different groups of people all over the world. 
particularly here in the United States, the underprivileged people. Watts, for instance, happened to be where I have Kids Build Foundation, and those kids are still going strong. But in working with different areas of, and different communities of the United States of America and trying to see the problems among the different groups of people, I would report it to whatever politician I could get my hands on and say, look what's happening over there, what's happening over there, what are we doing about it? Anyway, when I was given the floor to give my opinions of why there was so much juvenile delinquency in the streets of America. In the land of free speech. Right, and I relayed to Mrs. Johnson what the young boys and their parents had told me. And therefore, since I was not on the side of what the subject, according to Mrs. Johnson, was supposed to be that they let's beautify America. I said, yes, I believe in America being beautified, but given you, you can only afford to beautify America with people who have jobs and not punishing the good, but taking care of the good. What happened? Actually, according to <clears throat> Eartha, it was in 1968 after that White House thing. Her career came to a halt. She was blacklisted. She went abroad and worked overseas, and it wasn't until six years later, about six years later, that she came back. Uh, within uh, the time frame that we've been talking about, Eartha married once for how long? Five years. A man who was in real estate. Well, he was in school at the time I married him. Bad guy, good guy? <laughs> well, it's very difficult for me to answer. He wasn't very nice to me from a, a man-woman point of view, because he was always constantly putting me down. But, so that part of him was very insulting, and then he was a thief and all that sort of thing. Was a thief? He was a thief, yes. He did get a lot of um, good properties out of me. But on top of all of that, I got the best of the deal anyway, because I've got my child out of it. We're going to meet her child when we return. Bill McDonald, I guess the best thing is sitting next to Eartha Kitt. Please welcome her daughter, Kit McDonald. Kit is married, Kit is pregnant, uh, and just had amnio yesterday. I'm the first person to see pictures. Inside, this is really called inside pictures. Uh, since we have so little time, I'm going to throw some names out at you. Eartha had, was very in love with Arthur Lowe from Lowe's movie theaters, Lowe's cinemas. That's right. Would you have married him? Oh, yes. But his oh. mother had me kidnapped in order for him to think that I was a bad girl. Really? That's right. The mother-in-law broke it up. That's right. Why? His mother broke it yeah. up. Yeah. Well, he's the only son, and all that money is never going to go into the hands of a brown-skinned woman. Okay. Charles Revson, yes. Revlon Cosmetics president. Yes. Charles Revson, what happened? Well, he was having trouble with the $64,000 question, and he was told that he had to put me in the background for the moment. Another brown skin woman story, right? Yes, and at the same time, he was afraid that if it was known, because his ex-wife was also threatening him that she would reveal that he was having a brown skin mistress because she was asking for X amount of millions and also two children. And with the $64,000 question, would have put Charlie Revson in much more trouble. And he was afraid that some of his stockholders would pull out. There's a picture of you either dancing or rehearsing with Catherine Dunham, and there's a gentleman in the back, back row dancing who looks like Jimmy Dean. It is Jimmy Dean. Jimmy Dean was a dancer? Well, he was taking physical uh, movement for stage presence, which eventually became my job for him because he asked me to take over when he was not able to go to civil efforts classes. So we became spiritual soul mates. 
And I always feel that Jamie is still with me because he was one of those people that didn't have to talk to me or I to him. We always knew what the other one was thinking. What a wonderful combination. I feel that way about her, too. <laughs> uh, my kids <clears throat> can't think I'm a pain and, uh, you know, too possessive, stop calling me, why do you worry about me, I'm a grown-up. Is she that same kind of mother I am? Not in the sense that she calls me a lot. I mean, I feel her vibes constantly and we speak all the time, but it's not in the same sense and she's not a pest. She's not a pest. No. <laughs> is she a good, is she a good in mother? In spite of what the public No, you, be quiet. <laughs> talking to the star right now. <laughs> Sorry, Eartha. Uh, is she a good mother? Oh, yes. Definitely. You love her? Oh, more than, more than anything. The, the most, in, isn't it wonderful to hear a daughter say the most important thing in my life or one of the most important things in my life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you made this work with your husband? Yes, definitely. Definitely. My, my husband and my mother happen to get along very well, although she won't admit it. Thank God. <laughs> we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Eartha Singh. With an old-fashioned mind Not sophisticated I'm the sweet and simple kind I want an old-fashioned house With an old-fashioned fence And an old-fashioned millionaire I'd like a plain, simple car A Cerise Cadillac Long enough to put a bowling alley in the back I want an old-fashioned house With an old-fashioned fence and an old-fashioned millionaire. I'll stay weaving at my loom, be no trouble to my groom, if you keep the piles of a money mountain. In our cottage there will be a sound roof nursery, not to wake my baby while I'm counting. I like the old-fashioned flowers, violets are for me. Have them made in diamonds by the man at Tiffany. I want an old-fashioned house with an old-fashioned fence and an old-fashioned millionaire. I'm just a pilgrim at heart, oh so pure and genteel. Watch me in Las Vegas when I'm at the spinning wheel. I want an old-fashioned house with an old-fashioned fence and an old-fashioned millionaire. I'll ask for such simple things when my birthday occurs. Two apartment buildings that are labeled hers and hers. I want an old-fashioned house with an old-fashioned fence and an old-fashioned millionaire. I like Chopin and Bizet and the songs of yesterday, string quartets and Polynesian carols. But the music that excels is the sound of oil wells as they slurp, slurp, slurp into the barrels. Our little home will be quaint as an old parasol. And instead of carpets, I'll have money wall to wall. I want an old fashioned house with an old fashioned fence and an old fashioned millionaire. C'est si bon de pas dire ne pas du pas de surdition en chantant des chansons. C'est si bon de se dire à des mots doux, de pas dire rien de tout, mais qui ont dit en langue en voyant notre mineur vieux. Les passants dans la rue nous ont vieux. De guider dans ses yeux, tout n'est pas au milieu qui donne le frisson de si bon. Ces petites sensations, ça va bien. On a c'est tellement bon, c'est bon. Voilà, c'est bon. 
Parlez-vous français? Anglais. Français, anglais, ou quoi, 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 quoi. Not much of anything, right? Alors, ça m'est égal, vous savez. Parce que si vous pouvez parler en anglais, en français, italien, quelque chose comme Hebrew, soit Hebe. Ça m'est égal. Donnez sous tes seigneurs. Where are you from? You're from Florida. Vous no vivez ici, en Nueva York? You, now you live in New York? Ay, Dios mío, entre Florida y Nueva York. ¿Y ¿No le hablan español? No es posible, señor. Si usted vive en Florida o aquí en Nueva York, usted es obligada de hablar la lengua de español. Señor, no lo sabe nada. No tiene cabeza, ¿no? Sin vergüenza. Pero no es muy importante. ¿Y usted bien, señor? Se me diga. Walla sete. Need more time. Gosh, I could listen to you sing forever. All right, people just have to go and show up in person. Kit, tell me about the wedding when, I mean, this is the only child you've had or ever going to have, and she goes and gets married. Tell us about that. It was a very difficult time. <laughs> uh, needless to say, I know weddings usually are. This was very difficult. As an only child and a parent with a, a single parent, it's a very difficult time. It symbolizes a tremendous loss. Uh, it was very hard for my mother and consequently it was hard on me. Did you go to the wedding? Well, she, well, she gave me away. She walked me down the aisle. You did? Oh, great. I love it. I love That's that. That's the interesting thing, that you give your child away yeah. Not only are you giving it away, but you're paying for it. <laughs> did, Kit, did you ever want to be in show business yourself? Um, I probably did and avoided it because <laughs> of, uh, of uh, fear of competing with my mother in some way. I'm sure that's underlying. You seem very together and we hear so many stories of what it's like to be the kid of somebody famous in show business. Six years of therapy. Is that, <laughs> is that the answer? No, it's not, it's not totally the answer. I'm, a lot of the reason I'm together is because of my mother and she, uh, w she was very s strict in my upbringing and I think she made me a very stable person. You are a very stable person. Amazing. You know what? With I thank all you, I thank you for that. Oh, yeah. you. Be sure with, you do the same to your grandchild. To with all the <laughs> stuff <laughs> that went on, that's the best production number, isn't it? Mm. Amazing. We'll oh, take yes. a break. We'll be right back. It will be appearing in July at the Roosevelt Hotel in Los Angeles. I want that room filled every single night. The book is called... I'm Still Here. And you can purchase it in merry old England. I'm glad you're still here. I wish I had more of you to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Come see us again. Some members of our audience will receive and a promotional fee has been provided by...